Um, the most important thing we're trying to get across to people in, rela in, in relating to using your practice in everyday life. And in the past week, I've had three or four people that have had a lot of problems with the um, idea that what I don't have time to meditate. You see, if that's what I hear, I hear I don't have time to meditate. But the funny thing about TWIM that you need to really try to get a hold of in your mind is that TWIM, the practice, is uh, something that should become part of you. And it, it becomes so it's running all the time and you're training your mind. So let's just look at this is pretty good, this one. Um, TWIM reveals the true nature of how phenomena arises or the actuality, that means the way things actually work. You get to, this arises uh, by observing the impersonal nature of human cognition. Human cognition is how everything is working between your sense doors, the contact, the feeling, and then the liking or disliking of the feeling, which is a personal thing that happens after feeling. That's the first point. When we teach you the dependent origination in detail, we see that the six sense doors in the body and the, uh, the, there's a mental uh, mentality, uh, materiality, a mind-body connection, and there's also the physical existence of six sense doors, and there is a mental part of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, and in thinking, there is a mental part of all of these things that happen. So that's all part of the human body. And when contact happens, if you have an operating six base system for your sense, uh, sensory uh, perception to happen, then it's going to happen in the human being as you live, okay? And then what happens is when the contact happens, feeling comes up. And we basically want you to really understand three, two, you can go down to two, a pleasant or a painful feeling. So a pleasant one, you try to remember. Pleasant means I like it, which can transfer into I want it to keep going and attachment and involvement with it or mental proliferation, ongoing thinking about that feeling. And oh, when you have a mental feeling, it translates into a verbal translation of the feeling and then an action. So these three things are happening. So when you look at this as a very simple part of the Abhidhamma, when you learn it in the very beginning, this simple part, you don't need to get into the complex study of it. We're we have looked and examined for 20 years, what does the person need in order for the person to be able to live and be happier and easier about life? They only need to understand this basic stuff. And if they have a painful feeling, then it flips into, I personally don't like it. It is this personal flip into the um, not liking it that is then going to go into not wanting it in your mind and thinking about ways to get rid of it or stop it. And that's an again, that's an attachment, but not liking it is an aversion, a discontent. That's a kind of hindrance, right? So that's an unholes minute. So this is, this is the way it's working all the time when you are living. Okay, now mindfulness is the next one. Mindfulness helps us to keep this observation going and it helps to keep you smiling, helps you, supports you to smile. Remember we say that whenever you're feeling down, and this is important in the, in the lockdown, you're starting to feel just down. Like, when is this going to end? Like, when can I go outside? Oh, I want to go see the flowers. I want to know what's in Goa. Oh, gee. <laughs> and I've been here over 80 days. I, I have no idea what's in Goa. I went online to see pictures of what's in Goa, but I don't go anywhere. Sometimes I go to one store and shop and come back, or most everything comes to the door and people leave it. 
But the point is mindfulness part is being this observation skill that we show you and the observation skill is going and it helps you to keep smiling. It supports you because you understand what's happening with your mind. When you start to get down, if you look closely, you should keep a score pad. I used to keep a score pad when I was working back in uh, early when I was working with Bhante. Just a piece of paper in my tr in the trailer where I was living, okay? And I would. What happened to me today when I felt sad? I didn't like something. What did I not like? I didn't like something that already happened or, or someone's opinion or an old thing from the past I started to think about. I would rather be somewhere. I don't want to be um, you know, here. Uh, this sort of thing is, is complaining about where you are now and then getting worried about how long am I going to have to stay here? I don't want to stay here anymore. Oh my gosh. You see, and I get wrapped up in worry about what's going to happen next. Well, the thing about this is looking, look at nature. And when you look at nature, everything is changing all the time. You want me to really teach you about Anicca so you really understand it. You come for a walk with me in the woods and I'll show you a tiny seedling, a little tree, a teenage tree, a 10 foot tree, a 50 foot tree, a tree that fell down, a tree that rotted, and a tree just left a bunch of chunky dark colored stuff on the ground and it's a shadow of an old tree that is gone. It rotted away completely. Big tree. That is a Nietzsche. And that is our life. That is our day. That is our trip when we go on. Everything that arises is passing away and changing all the time. So the question is, if you have this knowledge, knowing knowledge does not clear your mind. Stopping this just stopping this each time you do it it does not change you so it doesn't happen to you again remember that that's what the the steps of right effort are about to let go of the feeling which is harming you or hurting you and not bring up anything else in place of it, it doesn't ever change the human being. So if we really believe and see when Bhante was teaching, we would, he was honestly showing me, we're going to examine the Majima Nikaya first, not the Samyutta, not the Anguttara, because those are support things that are gathered in pieces that are smaller pieces as support things to remember. But we want to learn the Majima Nikaya because it's the whole teaching is in that book. This is the amazing thing. We were talking about this this morning. And when we really learn the Majima Nikaya, about 76 of the 152 suttas are good information for your meditation. That's amazing. 22 of the 76 are the suttas that we would really want you to know very well because those are the ones we draw from when we're teaching you even what I'm telling you now, where it all came from. So that's not a lot. That's not a lot. When you consider that he, he, uh, he taught so many, many, many suttas in his lifetime, 86,000 sutta lessons, and then 2,000, 84,000, and, 80, and, and 2,000 more by the Arahats that are preserved along with his 84,000. And we don't need all of them. So spending time with that, when you know the key pieces, then you start living it. That's how you start smiling more and laughing at what's troubling you more often. And yeah, you might get upset, but what you find out is only for a few seconds. Whereas it troubled you all day, all night, all week. Now it'll shrink and shrink and shrink away because it's diminishing. Why? Because your brain is finally learning. You are a powerful person. We are not weak people as human beings. 
We are all strong people. Now, I, I had an experience this week with uh, someone who was explaining to me, but my inner child, and I, we had a discussion this morning, Bonte and me, I know about the inner child. I've had uh, experiences with this and people have, I've helped people sort of like get over the inner child. The inner child I like to say we need to hold on to is the childlike wonderment of this world and how much fun you can have discovering new things and how bright this can make you feel if you leave the past alone consciously just leave it alone and you leave the future alone you've only got this much to live in in the present time as you go through your life that's not heavy anymore. That's really cool. It's really cool to do this. So what is it that gets you down? What is it that's the problem when we walk through this thing? The problem is the craving, and that's the part that becomes personal. The feeling arises, fine, it's pleasant or it's personal, but I can even measure when a feeling pops up. If we put things on your head, we can measure it from your brain, uh, activating when something comes up. But that's all, that's the physical part. But then there's a place in there where volition counts, and this is choice, your free will to decide. What are you going to do with the thoughts or the things you saw or heard or felt? What are you gonna do with them when they come up? And that's your personal decision making. So we're not chasing uh, you personally away. Let's get this clear. You are very powerful and the Buddha knew it. He taught you to choose to crave and cling or not to crave and cling. I can't decide that Dhamma Gavesi is not going to crave and cling. Uh, you can't decide that I'm not going to crave and cling. Only I can decide. That's where this, the good part, the wholesome part of this decision ability of the human being comes in. Will I choose wholesome path, wholesome thoughts, words, and actions, and keep my precepts, or will I not? That's a decision. You make it. I don't make it. A wholesome part of with you. Okay, when you make that decision, the next thing you're looking at, that decision, the craving is, was there a way, did he find, the Buddha find a way to identify it? The craving, which causes the the continue the falling into the suffering mentally and physically and the aches and pains of depression and all of it did he show you a way to determine how to catch it and change it he did so if you're ignoring it we've been telling you how many and you just need to put a sign up and i tell people it's hard because we have a habit of th believing Everything is happening to me. It's happening on my head. Bang. It's happening on my head some more. Okay? More. It's more and more. Bang. More and more. Books, books, books on top of my head. Weights pushing me down. Well, that's up to you if it's happening to you. But the Buddha said, that he's explaining to you how it happens. And he tells you this craving when it happens, any time of the day, any time of the night, any time anything's going on is when you start to get tense and tight in your mind and in your body. You move from here to here to here with tension. And it goes as far as you allow it to come. And if you embrace it, you get upset in heated emotions. But this is how this is working. And he's telling you, this is your clue. This is how this works. And it comes up and as it gets tight, what do I do? That's your signal. Your signal is to do your six R's. Now the purification is when you make that decision. This is the purification. The purification of your mind is the moment you feel the tension and tightness. And I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I don't want that. No, he's wrong. She's not telling it right. What's wrong here? 
all these opinions come and you've made a decision to embrace the tension and the tightness and all of it had comes back to what comes back to me and my personal opinion right so the way to the wholesome turns out to be anatta grabbing it is the atta releasing it is the anatta is the way out there you go and so the purification is to do the six r's reveal what it reveals that a personal perspective can lead to delusion that's thinking i have to have my personal opinion everything's about me and the craving and the clinging so the delusion fires that craving and pushes to the clinging is you pushing into the story about oh why do i not like it i don't like that opinion my opinion is right his is wrong etc and so forth Her, she doesn't know what she's talking about i'm this is the way it has to be we can't do it that way that's all personal opinion you see that but relax step back consider what everybody has ideas in the house put them in a bowl try them out see what works well don't get in arguments or get heated about it make it a game to see if you can step outside and watch the personal opinions in front of you happening and you're the only one that knows how it's working and then you you what you're doing is you're stepping out of the play now you don't have any reason to get upset now you can look at the play and see what's going on and change the suffering next one is the purify we are we are purifying in the 6 Rs we are purifying and retraining our minds so the purification which i showed you and now the retraining of the mind is to operate in a more impersonal way a way that leads to fully understanding how suffering is working and the cause of it and the cessation of it and how can i improve my ability to work more productively at home at school at work in life how we as human beings have some some things happening in the whole world it isn't just in the united states it's happening in china it's happening in hong kong it's happening in africa it's happening all around it's a waking up time so we can wake up we can wake up now ourselves in our own way by seeing how things actually work and all of a sudden we understand i told you last week you men I told you last week you want to help fix somebody's car but you don't know what the engine is and how it works in the parts and you throw up in the hood you know and you're going to fix it <laughs> you know but you know where the oil goes in <laughs> and some of the new cars are funny because they have a little red thing and an orange thing a yellow thing and they tell you you can touch this one for the oil you can touch this one for the transmission fluid and you can touch this one for the water D don't touch anything else <laughs> but if my car breaks down that i want to talk to the guy that learned the pieces of how it works he's the only person or the woman who can fix that by understanding how all the pieces are working okay now the next one is repeating uh, you, you're doing that, you are retraining it in a more impersonal way for that reason, to change your behavior. And this is what we taught in Sunday school. What I taught in Sunday school was how do you change your behavior? You know, if you're doing something your parents don't want you to be doing, uh, the young child is tapping on the table. He comes to the dinner table, tap, tap on the table. And you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to come to the table and sit down, put your hands in your lap. <laughs> Wait for your food to be served. But they keep doing this. What does the grandmother do? She's sitting beside. She says, stop. Now put your hand in your lap. Stop. Now put your hand in the lap. She keeps doing that a month who knows how long until the child comes to the table and sits down and puts their hands in their lap what did she do why did the child change the behavior because there was a patient poking a, 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 the 
same thing every time with the same instruction, the same way, until finally they did it. They did it. And this is fantastic. They changed. This is what you can do with your mind. This is how your brain works. Okay, the repeating the six R's leads to a gradual cessation of destructive suffering, okay? And it changes you to a, a non-destructive way of life, a healthy way. So when we're saying this one section, purify and retrain your life two different things so we have a lot of people who think that right effort is stop this this uh this uh hindrance that's coming up stop the distraction we have to stop it we have to push it down and press it and subdue it and work very hard to control it to stop it guess what guess what that doesn't change anything it's going to keep coming back this is a known fact with behavioral patterns. It will come back every time unless what? Unless you change it and support it with the precepts. They're there to help you. Uh, and as long as you keep your precepts, those hindrances will stop coming up because the, the precepts are the way to not irritating the system and not causing those hindrances to come back karmically you see so the 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 hindrances when they arise the five of them but then there's 11 in another sutta and 16 in another one all of those hindrances they happen because we broke a precept somewhere sometime in this life today yesterday last year early on when we were children we did something and that's why this behavior is in a relationship irritating us and you know what don't back up and go and say oh it was my inner child's fault it's not mine <laughs> inner child is okay to be in there to help you to be happy to remember how to live lighter that was a lesson to be sharper with your focus that was a lesson those little kids are very sharp with their attention as they move along in life we, we don't do that. We have all this stuff going on in our mind. I love the kids, the twos and threes and fours. Wonderful experience teaching them, you know? So repeating the six R's leads to the change in the destructive behavior. This, other, this one at the bottom here, the practice proves that the early Buddhist teaching was priceless. And it still today can offer the most important answers for today's life in the workplace and at home and at school when it comes to mental and physical types of pain. You break a leg in athletics, you talk to me about what to do while it's healing. So you don't wanna, oh, you don't wanna get so upset with pain. And if you, if you learn how to work with pain, physical pain, it will heal much faster. This has all been tested, this is not, uh, not uh, anything more. Is there another page to this, Tom Is there another one? No, I don't think so. This is the mm -hmm. last summary page. Okay, fine. So it proves you can take it down. You can take it down. So it basically proves that he had the most important thing to me is that the Buddha did not teach something that was isolated to the temple, something that was isolated to go to the retreat to feel better, come back into the belly of the beast and suffer in life like you were suffering before. <laughs> That's not it. That's not it. He was actually doing something far more significant. He was teaching you how to literally change. That's why we tell you, if you change your mind, where it all starts and flows from there down through you. There's all kinds of little exercises you can do in Sunday school. My mind starts here. It doesn't stay. It goes down through all the way. You can have them sit and stand with the, the three, you look at your three pillars, uh, uh, Donna, Sila, Bhavana, to sit down. And then you say, ah, Sila, Samadhi, Panya, and you get up. It's amazing what the Thais have done with that. To drill into the children so that they permanently remember these pieces. The generosity opens my heart, prepares me 
to do this practice. The generosity is generous thoughts, generous words, generous deeds of helping others. You see the generosity. The sila is the protection, the umbrella that tries to keep the hindrances from coming down and it, they can't get through the umbrella because the, the precepts protect you. But if you break them, it can get through. Then you have to say the precepts again and start again <laughs> until the brain learns to keep it like this. They used to draw pictures of the big umbrella and put the picture of the hindrances over the top of it. Yeah. We're all in this together, what's going on with COVID. Everyone needs to pull together everywhere. I'm gonna leave you now and give you over to Bonte. He's gonna work with number 44. So if you have your book with you, if you have the Majim and Nikai, you turn to, uh, it's page 396 of the uh, Majim and Nikaya, and it is the Chula Vidala Sutta. And during this sutta, he's going to bring up the Eightfold Path. So you have the Eightfold Path pieces. And the next time we will talk about, you know, there's never an excuse for you to ever come. You can figure this out for yourself, but never an excuse for you to ever come after you learn the Eightfold, eight pieces of this Eightfold Path and say to me, oh, but sister, I didn't have time to practice the Eightfold Path last week. And I'll say, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a customer service person. I work 10 hours a day. Oh, I said, customer service, do you smile? So next time I will show you how you can complete the whole entire eightfold path every time you smile. So that woman, she was really actually doing it and she didn't even know it. When, we question, when I questioned her on the parts of what the Eightfold Path were, eventually she figured out she was doing it. And that's the whole point of the, what the Buddha is uh, talking about. Philosophy is talking and talking about all these pieces, but never actually doing anything. But then the Buddha comes along and he says, you need to learn this but you need to apply it from your mind into life. And then you start to fly. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get Panti and I say sadhu, I thank you for this time. Okay, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Welcome Panti. Pandami Panti. Oh, oh, okay. You know, it's a real interesting phenomena that so many people know about the Four Noble Truths and what they, the way they talk about it is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And there's no and Eightfold Path in it. It's the Four Noble Truths. And an awful lot of people have an understanding of the Four Noble Truths that's very rudimentary, very, very uh, shallow in thinking. So I'm going to give you the Four Noble Truths. I'm going to give you the Four Noble Truths, but I'm going to give them to you with my definitions. Because you're going to understand it more deeply. And an awful lot of people like to break up the Four Noble Truths into three different sections. And it just doesn't work that way. So, When, we're, when we start talking about the Four Noble Truths, 
the sutta number 44, the shorter series of questions and answers, starts off right straight away by asking about what is called identity by the Blessed One? What is called identity by the Blessed One? Now, this is a, a woman arahat that's talking to a man who is an anagami. And she says, these five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are called identity by the Blessed One. Now the thing is, the thing with the five aggregates, they can be affected by clinging, craving and clinging or not depending on how you observe. If you are taking things personally and you're kind of caught up in the whole process of thinking about, you're, you're caught up in craving and clinging and clinging. So there is some suffering that goes along with it. If you're using the six R's and you're using your mindfulness correctly, you are going to be developing a mind that has more and more equanimity in it. And this is very important. An awful lot of people get caught up in emotional upsets and emotional dislikes of what's happening to them in the present. And they take it all personally and they kind of fight with it and argue and, and basically make themselves sad. The importance of practicing the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path is for you to realize that this helps you to develop your mind in a way where you have more balance in it all the time. And often a lot of people have an idea that, oh, meditation is just so, <coughs> meditation is just for sitting and, and being quiet. And everything in life is part of meditation. If your mindfulness is there. And what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is your observation power. So you can see how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. and not take it personally. Now the Eightfold Path has eight different sections in it. And they're all interconnected with each other. Every time you use the six R's, you are practicing the Eightfold Path at that time. Your mind is much more clear and alert. 
So it's a very important thing for you to remember that meditation is about living a life that has balance in it. Living a life that has joy in it. Not getting caught up in the fears of some kind of sickness or other. Practicing, allowing whatever is in the present to be there without resistance. So when, when the Arahat got asked a question about what is called identity, her answer to him was, that is material form aggregate, which may or may not be affected by craving and clinging. The feeling aggregate, which may or may not be affected by craving and clinging. The perception aggregate affected by, which may be affected by craving or and clinging. The formation aggregate which may or may not be affected by craving or clinging. And consciousness aggregates, which may or may not be affected by craving and clinging. If it is affected by craving and clinging, it means that it is an attachment to you. You're taking whatever that feeling or perception, whatever it happens to be, you're taking it personally and you have tightness in your head, in your mind. And that is how you recognize when you have craving and you're caught by craving. So if it's, if craving and clinging are present, there is attachment. There is craving. And it affects you both mentally and physically. So it's real important for you to recognize how much the Buddha is giving you when he gives you the Eightfold Path. Because he is giving you guidelines of what to do when they arise. And he's showing you the way to have balance in your mind no matter what. Saying, good lady, the lay follower Visaka, delighted and rejoiced in the bhikkhuni Dhammadina's words. And then he asked him, her, a further question. Lady, the origin of identity, the origin of identity is said. What is called the origin of identity? Friend Visaka, it is craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this and that. That is craving. So the, the cause of craving is what? is your attachment. What causes craving to arise? I like it or I don't like it. A feeling arises. 
If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. Now, what does that mean? I like it. I, I'm taking it personally. That's the very beginning of craving. And when you like something, you have a tendency to want to hold on to it. Okay. So craving is the I like it, or if it's a painful feeling and you don't like it, then you try to push that feeling away. I don't like it. I don't want it around. So craving is the I like it or I don't like it mind. How many times do you get caught in a day liking something or disliking something without actually recognizing that you're doing that? So you need to, one, want to change. That is major. If you're doing the meditation and you just want to keep life the same as it's always been, you're wasting your time doing the meditation. You have to want to let go of the suffering. You have to want to let go of any kind of disturbance. Now, every time you have some kind of disturbance that pulls your attention away from what you're doing while you're doing it, that is called a hindrance. And what causes hindrances to arise? Hindrances arise because in the past you have broken precepts. Now in my country, people don't think much about the precepts at all. Oh, that's not important. I just told a little lie. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because every time you break a precept, you have hindrance arise. And that turns into a lot of suffering. So it's real important for you to understand that everything that I show you is interconnected. The Eightfold Pass is, is connected to the other four noble uh, other noble truths which is connected to craving, which is connected to suffering, which is connected to hindrances, which is connected to sadness and pain. So it's real important for you to understand that Everything is interconnected. And the only way that you can begin to understand what the Buddha was talking about is by having the desire to let go of that suffering. You have to have desire to let go. And if you don't, then you're just going to play with the meditation and it's a waste of time for you and me. You have to be willing to change and you have to want to change. Okay.
So when you start thinking about the Eightfold Path and you start thinking about all of these different, if you do right and you do wrong, then life is black and white. <coughs> and life is never black and white. So we start out by calling it harmonious perspective. I had a, a somebody ask a medit one of my meditation teachers, he said, okay, the, the Eightfold Path, it always starts out with harmonious perspective or right view. Why did the Buddha start it out that way? And I was rather shocked because this was a senior meditation teacher that had been teaching for 40 years anyway. And he came out with kind of a flippant answer. He said, it started out because that's what the Buddha wanted to start with which was not a very good answer to my way of thinking. He started out with harmonious perspective because this is the most important aspect of the Buddha's teaching. What is harmonious perspective? It means there's no craving in your mind. You've already used the six R's. Your mind is clear, your mind is alert, your mind is very bright and balanced. So the Buddha started out with harmonious perspective because that's a really, really important part of his teaching. Why do I say that's a, it, you could almost say it's the most important part. Because there's no craving in your mind. Your mind is pure at that time. So you hear me say a lot, I want you to practice the six R's. It isn't a maybe. And it's not when I have time. It's right now. Purify your mind. Open your mind. Let go of that painful attachment to whatever it is that disturbed your mind. Now, an interesting thing about this harmonious perspective is that there is nothing in the world that is truly atta. Everything is a part of anatta. It's impersonal. There's nothing personal in this world. You say, my body, well, that's mine. Well, that's an impersonal body. Anytime you take something personally, you cause yourself suffering. And you need to let go of that suffering by recognizing, releasing, relaxing, re-smiling, come back and stay with your attention on what you're doing while you're doing it. Not just a little important, very important. 
So the more you get in the habit of using the six R's, the more you get in the habit of relaxing into things, the more you recognize when your mind is becoming distracted, the easier life becomes. The more alert mind becomes. The more balance there is in mind. And you become more intelligent. You start seeing the way things actually are and you start going, well, I'm, I'm causing myself suffering. Why am I doing that? Let's let that go. The second fold of the eightfold path, it, this is important too, because this has to do with the way you, you see and observe the world. And it is called harmonious imaging. They call it right thought, but that's not a very good way of looking at this. You image a lot of things about the way you are. You use the image of, oh, I'm a happy person. I'm intelligent. I, I do this. I, I'm this. I'm that. Be careful how you image yourself. The more you use a positive image, the more you use thoughts of loving kindness and wishing other people happiness while you're walking down the street, then you start to get in the habit of thinking that you are a happy person and you like yourself for being happy. You're using an image that's very uplifted. I know an awful lot of people that they use images of being poor, being nasty, being unhappy, being sad, you can hold those images about yourself if you want, but it doesn't lead to an uplifting feeling. Now they've been doing a lot of studies with a lot of different kinds of thoughts and seeing what it does in your mind because they're starting to get more and more sensitive types of equipment that they can see. And an interesting thing is that people that hold an image of being grateful, of accepting everything that's happening in the present and being grateful for it being there, even if it's a painful feeling, the more you hold this image of being grateful, the more uplifted your mind becomes. And your, your brain actually starts to get smarter because it starts growing with this positive energy. So being grateful for whatever is happening, being grateful for the sickness that's going around here. Don't hate it. Don't hate having to, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. No, you don't. You can be grateful for it. You can appreciate it. You don't fight with it. I know some people that they really hold negative images of themselves. And they are really unhappy. 
and they're doing it to themselves. That's the problem. One, they're taking the feeling personally. And two, they are trying to control it. When you hold an image of an uplifted mind, an accepting mind, not a resisting mind, everything gets easy. Everything becomes more alive. And you don't hold on to unhappy things when you hold an image of being prosperous, of being happy, of being balanced. I hold an image of having very strong equanimity. And that's what I become. I become very strong with my equanimity. I laugh quite often. I had to hold an image of being happy. I help other people to be happy. I hold that image of being able to do that. So the more you practice gratefulness, and this, this is conscious. You have to be conscious of doing it make it into a habit of making other people smile. Okay? That's harmonious imaging. And it's very, very important that you practice that along with harmonious what? Harmonious. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> practice. <laughs> Harmonious perspective. Mm -hmm. See how your perspective changes when you do these two together. Now, the next fold of the Eightfold Path is something that is real important too. We have a habit of if we make a mistake or we do something that's not so good, we wind up criticizing ourselves a lot. Okay. Now, instead of beating yourself up and criticizing yourself and not liking yourself and getting angry with yourself, all of those kind of things are wrong imaging. It's unwholesome. You're not following the Eightfold Path. You're not following having harmonious perspective when you're criticizing yourself and angry at yourself, right? And you're not holding an image of being a happy person at that time. And you keep repeating over and over the same sentences. Just like it's on a, ta on a tape deck. Well, that's unwholesome. The next fold of the Eightfold Path is harmonious communication. Communicate with yourself. Be gentle to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. Welcome to the human race. We're all going to make mistakes. But that doesn't mean that you have to 
beat yourself up because of it. I had one student that he was always criticizing himself and beating himself up and not liking himself. So I told another student of mine to go into town and get me some boxing gloves. And he did. And I went to this student that was always so hard on themselves and so angry with themselves so much of the time. I gave him some boxing gloves and told him to put them on. He said, why do I have to do that? I said, well, you spend so much time beating yourself up. I thought it'd be a little bit easier on you if you didn't hurt yourself. And he laughed right after that. Now he was angry right before that. When I gave him the gloves, he, he was still not happy person. As soon as he left, he changed his communication with himself. And all of a sudden his, his, his mind became uplifted and happy. The interesting thing with this is the more you practice smiling and laughing with yourself, the lighter your mind becomes, the more you affect the people around you in a positive way. and the more fun life becomes. Now, when I give a retreat, one of the first things I tell everybody is there's three things I want you to do. And I want you to remember this and practice this. One, you got to smile. All the time, smile. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you made, made a mistake. I also want you to laugh. Laugh when you make a mistake. Stop being so serious. Stop getting caught in repeating the same thing over and over again. Because when you do that, that causes more and more suffering and that causes that craving to get more intense and you are causing that for yourself. So get in the habit of communicating with yourself in a kind way, in a gentle way, in a fun way. So I want you to smile. I want you to laugh and I want you to have fun. And when you don't, you have to take a look at that a little bit more closely to see how much pain you're causing yourself. Now, when I, when I first started out, I said that you cause yourself pain. You have to be able to recognize how that pain arises. You have to stop taking things personally. You have to start using that positive imaging power. And you have to communicate not only with yourself, but with other people. And this is very important. When you start making it a habit of communicating not only with yourself, but with other people around you in a kind way, your whole life is going to change but you have to want to do it. That's the key. 
You have to want to change. Now, sometimes I have a student that I might tell them the same thing over and over again, maybe 50 or 75 times. And then all of a sudden they'll come to me and they'll go, wow, I just figured this out. I just figured out how I make myself sad. And I say, good. You've only heard me say this 7,500 times, it seems like. But you have to keep repeating this over and over in your mind so you change your old habit. So you let go of the things that cause you pain, the dislikes, the dissatisfactions. the beating yourself up over and over again. The next fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right action. I call it harmonious movement. Watch how your mind moves from one thing to another. Watch how your mind grabs onto things and relax into them. It's real important that you do this. Watch that movement. The closer you watch the movement, the more you start changing your personality and the easier things become. The whole thing comes down to letting go of old habits that cause suffering to yourself and to other people around you. The more you let go of that old habit, the more you start changing and the more you become more at ease with everything and everyone around you. The next fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it Right Livelihood. And I call it Harmonious Lifestyle. Harmonious lifestyle is being very careful about what you put in front of your mind. You read a newspaper every day and it's always negative. Guess what happens to your mind? Be careful of the kind of things you put in front of your mind. You watch television and you watch a lot of people hurting each other, well, that's not gonna uplift your mind any. That's gonna make you, that's not gonna make you feel happy, especially if you're watching the news and there's things that, where pe people are hurting each other or they're suffering in one way or another. Then you, get rid of the newspaper, or you get rid of the television and you don't watch it, watch how that changes your perspective, that, that changes your way of observing things. Remember, the task that we have is to develop that equanimity and balance with things. And the more balance you have, the lighter your mind becomes, the more joy you start to experience. Now, 
know, I spend an awful lot of time on retreats telling my, all of my students, be kind to yourself. Be gentle with yourself. because that leads to your uplifting lifestyle. So it's real important that you are careful with what you put in front of your mind. And that harmonious communication, that uplifted mind, that happy mind that's accepting, these are real important aspects that lead to your well being and happiness for a long time. The next fold of the Eightfold Path is, they call it right effort. And I've never liked that definition at all. I call it harmonious practice. That's what the six R's are. They are harmonious practice. You practice this every time you see your mind get off balance a little bit. Let it be relax, smile. See, uh, when I first started teaching this way, I'd been teaching uh, other kinds of meditation that they didn't really much lead to a happy mind. It had, it had the tendency to make my mind hard. And as a, as a result, all of my students had a hard mind and a critical mind. But when I started realizing the importance of smiling, and smiling all the time. I started noticing for myself that my mindfulness was much sharper, much more at ease, much more alert. And I could see my mind start to tighten up when something unagreeable started happening. So when I started, kept the smiling going, I could recognize that more quickly. And the quicker you recognize that you're not smiling and you start smiling again, your overall awareness of what is happening in the present becomes much more clear. And it becomes much easier to use your six R's with that smiling mind. Now, sometimes people will come and they'll, they'll practice with me and they'll walk in and I say, how's it going? And they say, oh, it's very terrible. My mind is running all over the place. It just doesn't slow down. As soon as I get, see something, I get halfway through that thought, another thought pops up. I don't know what to do. My mind is just so full of anxiety and restlessness. And you know what my answer to that is? Guess who forgot to smile today? You're not smiling enough. And the more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes, the more your mind calms down. 
and life starts to be fun again. So it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomena that you always need to keep that mind uplifted and happy. The more happy you become, the more you change the way you see the world around you. And that's real important. So practicing the six R's is that will take you if you are serious about practicing it and you remember to do it and you remember to keep your smile on. It will take you all the way to Arahatship. You can become an Arahat if you want to. It's up to you. You can do this. I know a lot of people that they talk about wanting to experience Nibbana and yeah, oh, I want that. I, I got to do it. Not willing to change. You have to be willing to change. It's not a maybe. You have to be willing to let go of your old habit of doing the same thing in the same way all the time. You have to practice. And this means when you're walking down the street, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're taking a shower, don't just let your mind ho-hum around and keep a smile going. The next fold of the Eightfold Path is, they call it right mindfulness, and that's, mindfulness is an interesting word because everybody is supposed to know what it means, but not many people have a definition of it. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another how mind's attention moves. It doesn't have anything to do with control. It doesn't have anything to do with force of keeping your attention on one thing at a time. It has to do with observing the slightest little movements of mind's attention and use your six R's and relax and let it be. Now the last fold of the eightfold path, they call it right concentration. And concentration is a word that's very much misunderstood because people have an idea that concentration means that you're really, really over-focusing on one thing and trying to force your mind to stay on that one thing. So I call this harmonious collectedness. A collected mind is a mind that is very much at ease, a mind that's quiet, a mind that's very composed. And when you have harmonious collectedness, you also are developing more and more of that equanimity that I keep talking about, that balance of mind, that acceptance of mind. 
Now, all of these are interconnected. Everything in the Eightfold Path is part of the same thing. It's just a different aspect of the same thing. And the more you get into the habit of using the Eightfold Path and practicing your six R's all the time, the more you will start to see a difference in the way you attend to the world around you. The less you will get emotionally upset. The more clear, the more bright, the more open everything becomes. And there's great advantage to doing this because you will start to change. I had students that they were going to their job every day, but before they went to their job, they sat in meditation with a smiling mind, with a happy mind, with practicing their generosity, giving that happiness away. And they were in a place that has a lot of traffic. And the traffic didn't bother them anymore. It didn't bother them that they got cut off, but somebody almost hit them. Their mind was more clear and accepting. And that's what the basic teaching of the Buddha is all about. And you become more clear, more bright, more alert, more happy. Okay. There's always advantage to following the Buddha's teaching. I'm trying to give you the Buddha's teaching in the simplest terms that I can. But it's your job to do it. I'll give you as close a uh, close a instruction as I can give you. But just listening to the instruction and then you get done listening to the Dhamma talk and go off and just let your mind be the way it's going to be. It's a waste of time for you and it's difficulty for me because it takes a lot of energy to do this. So please respect what I'm giving you and practice it as often as you possibly can. Get in the habit of getting up smiling. Well, you get, when you get up in the morning, you gotta brush your teeth anyway, right? So put a smile on your mind with it. What do you do when you walk from your house to your car to go drive somewhere? What are you doing with your mind? Why not wish somebody happiness? Why not continually be grateful for what's happening in the present? Acceptance, really important. 
have fun with what you're doing. Okay?